please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Out of thankfulness to God for his word, we will conclude the reading. I will say, this is the word of the Lord. We ask that you respond and read the underlined phrase, thanks be to God. Today's passage is from James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he may, has made dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned in mor to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. We'll be continuing our series in the book of James, and we're beginning in the, chap the fourth chapter of James. Um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Andrew, and I'm a member here. I would love to get to know you more and to talk with you after uh, the service. But this morning, we're going to be looking at the first 12 verses of the fourth chapter of James, and two things primarily. And those things are conflict. Somebody say conflict. conflict. 9 a.m. was much more awake than you guys are. Let's try it. Let somebody say conflict. conflict. Yes. And secondly, we're going to be looking at grace. Conflict and grace. And perhaps nothing is as practical in our day-to-day -day experience as discussing conflict. You don't have to look very far to find it. In my house with my three-year-old, conflict on my social media feed, conflict with my spouse from time to time more often than I'd like to admit. Conflict. Conflict is a part of the air we breathe and the water that we drink. And so if you're not in conflict right now, guess what? It's on the way. So we experience it in friendships, family, with kids, neighbors, strangers on the in internet. You know, conflict is unavoidable. And so James being very practical, but also very pastoral. He's going to spend some time in these verses discussing where it comes from and how we resolve it. And so what he's been doing the past few weeks in our study is he's been basically inviting us into his office where we have, a diagno we have symptoms of something, and he's putting us under the x-ray and looking at our hearts to see where these things really come from. So we're going to see in James 4, verses 1 through 12, uh, in two sections, I believe, our main idea. The first section is the problem of desire, and the second section is the solution for the heart. And the main idea, I think James gives it to us in verse 6, is this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us in our time in his word. Father, we need you. We need you right now to open our eyes, soften our hearts, to hear your word, and to respond to it. God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand. Give us new desires this morning, desires that love you above all things and love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray all this because of Jesus. Amen. 
So he wastes no time. In, ch- in verse 1 of chapter 4, he asks a question. So many good diagnostic questions. What's the problem? What are you struggling with? What's going on? And he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It's a great question. It's a very good diagnostic question. In conflict, so often when I say, what's the problem, we immediately go to a person or a situation or some occasion or something external outside of us. But James isn't going to let us get away that easy. No, he's actually going to turn the focus in on ourselves. We see in the second part of verse 1, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? As I was thinking about this verse this morning, it doesn't take uh, us too long to figure out that this is true. This is very true. Castaway movie with Tom Hanks. You might have seen it, might not have seen it. But anyway, basic premise of the movie, Tom Hanks is on a plane. The plane crashes, and he's alone on an island. Sometimes we think, oh, if I was alone on an island, I wouldn't have this struggle with conflict. He then makes himself a friend. That friend is a volleyball. He takes his hand, smacks it on the volleyball, and calls it Wilson. Wilson is his friend, and there's a scene in the movie where he gets angry at the volleyball, an inanimate object. Where is that anger coming from? The volleyball? or inside of him, inside of his own heart. The source of conflicts is actually our passions that are at war within us. He then takes the volleyball, throws it into the ocean. It's a fantastic scene. I highly recommend you watch the movie, maybe. Um, But he tells us the source immediately. The passions inside us are waging war. This isn't neutral language, and it's happening right now. This is wartime language. The word for passions in the Greek is hedone, where we get the idea of hedonism. This isn't new. Hedonism is a very old philosophy that says, at any and all cost, get yours. Seek your desires, your pleasures, whatever can arouse in you the most pleasure or happiness, those are the things that you need to go after. This is sinful, indulgent pleasure, self-centered, self-focused. So someone who we would say is hedonistic is someone who pursues their pleasures above all else. The late David Paulson, who was a counselor for over 30 years, said this about conflict. He said, I have yet to meet a couple locked in hostility who really understood and reckoned with their motives. Cravings underlie conflicts. Why do you fight? It's not because your wife, husband, boyfriend, uh, neighbor cousin. I just imagined Thanksgiving dinner. It's because of something about you. Couples who see what rules them, whether it's cravings for affection, attention, power, vindication, control, comfort, a hassle-free life, can repent and find God's grace made real to them and then learn how to make peace. This list isn't exhaustive. But I think it's getting at what James is talking about here. He's saying there's a craving, there's an, a desire for affection, attention, power, vindication, control that's underneath the surface. Maybe you've experienced this in the workplace with a boss who maybe is condescending. Maybe you've experienced this in a relationship where someone will manipulate to try and get their way at all costs. And if they don't, they will wage war against you and everyone around them. See, our culture and the world says, follow your heart, listen to your heart, do you, look out for yourself. But Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. Who can even understand it? Your heart is deceptive. Your desires are deceptive. So, The problem is far worse than we think. There's a war going on inside of you. But the problem is also more simple than you think. Sometimes in a conflict, um, even with my wife, for example, we'll be five minutes into a conflict and I will pull my hair out and ask, how did we get here? How did we even get here? And it seems so complicated in this moment. But James is saying, trace back to the root of this conflict. 
and you will find an inordinate desire that is waging war in your heart. So the problem is far worse, but far more simple than we think. And then in verse 2, he says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You hear echoes of Jesus' teaching. Jesus said that all murderous intent begins in our hearts, and it begins with envy. It begins with desire, with cravings underneath these conflicts. So James is presenting a connection for us to the theme of envy, which is all throughout the Old Testament. We see example after example of envy leading to murder. Cain envies God's approval of Abel. Abel, this is like one step out of the garden, murder because of envy. One step out of the garden. Genesis 4, Joseph's brothers were envious of him. They wanted to kill him, but instead sold him to slavery. So, you know, this isn't a good situation either. Saul envies David and seeks to kill him. Absalom envies his father's throne, and so he starts a civil war. The chief priests envy Jesus, and what do they do? They have him crucified. They have him murdered. Paulson is also helpful here. He says, every time you get angry, you make your values and your point of view explicit. Every time you get angry, you make your values and your point of view explicit. What makes you the most angry? What makes you the most angry? What consumes you? Are you willing to sin to get it? Do you sin when you don't get it? What are those things? James is asking us to be honest with ourselves. Quarrels and fights can occur quietly below the surface. A lot of times in uh, the church context, we put up a front. Maybe we step back. We get really quiet. We hide behind the veneer of meekness. But conflicts are waging war inside us all the time. But more often than not, eventually over time, these things bubble up and conflict starts coming out of our mouth. That's what James is getting at in verse 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, are you not a doer of the law but a judge? There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? See, the way we speak to one another reveals what is ruling us. Here, he's challenging brothers. This is people inside the household of faith. And he's saying this type of speech has no place. And Jesus would instruct us in the Sermon on the Mount, when you're judging others, maybe there's a way to do this. First, look at the plank in your own eye and then address the speck in your brothers. What's he saying? He's saying your greatest problem is your own sin. And by comparison, the plank to the speck, he's making it clear. Your greatest problem is your own desire, your own sin, your own cravings. So the name calling, the telling lies, the slander, the gossip have no place. Assuming the seat of judge over a brother has no place. Now, what he doesn't mean here is that we never go to a brother or sister that's in sin. But we go to them in confrontation as the chief sinner in the room, not as the judge over them telling them, do better. The hope is to restore fellowship, not to sever it. We're seeking reconciliation. And James is saying that this type of behavior reveals our hearts. So are you known by what you are against or what you are for? Are you known about the things and the slander and the gossip that's coming and oozing out of you? Or are you known by grace? Are you breathing grace, as Pastor Ian said last week? Do you breathe grace in conflict? Or do you breathe, breathe selfish desire? Another place that shows up is in our prayer life. So James says in the last part of verse 2, you do not have... Because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. 
You do not have because you do not ask. In conflict, are you prayerless? If you're prayerless in conflict, that's revealing how sufficient you feel you are in yourself. You don't think you need God. You can navigate this conflict by yourself. The way we pray or don't pray is making our desire and our self-centeredness very clear. Do we ask only to receive benefits? This is what he says in the second part of the verse. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend this on your passions. We ask to receive benefits or are we praying to God as the benefactor? Are we seeking the benefits or the great benefactor? Or is God simply your cosmic genie that you go to, you put in your coin and hope you get what you want? Consider how Jesus himself teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Probably all know it or some version of it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins or debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Notice the order and the flow of how Jesus is teaching us to pray. He's saying his name his kingdom, his will, before he steps into provision, pardon, and protection. He's saying, align with my agenda, align with my kingdom and my will, and then pray like we should, supplicate, with all supplication, making our needs known to the Lord. But it's still corporate in nature. The Lord's prayer, how Jesus teaches us to pray, tells us to pray for our provision, our pardon, and our protection. Not individualistic. This is not individualistic. So James is challenging us not to reverse that order, placing ourselves and our agenda in front of the Lord's. Rico Tice has a scathing quote about this, so I'm going to read it. We turn God into a divine waiter. He is there to deliver our dreams to us. We touch base with him on a Sunday. We put in an order in via prayer. We might even leave a decent tip in the collection plate. But God is essentially there to give us what we feel we need. And we get furious with him if he doesn't deliver. We get furious with him when he doesn't deliver. What does James call these cravings? in us, leading to poor treatment of others and to this distorted view of prayer. He says in verse 4, you adulterous people. How do you really feel, James? Why don't you tell us? Shots are fired. You adulterous people. All of the cravings that are coming and oozing out of us are pointing to our spiritual adultery. And the original reader of this letter would know immediately where James was going. All through the Old Testament, there's allusions to this over and over and over again. Consider Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker, God, is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. And then in Jeremiah three twenty, Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so you have been treacherous to me, O house of Israel declares the Lord. And then the story of Hosea. Read Hosea this week. Old Testament homework. Hosea is told by God, go marry a prostitute to symbolize his relationship to his people. But she is continually unfaithful. And so the Lord tells this to Hosea. This is beautiful. The Lord tells this to Hosea after his wife is unfaithful. He says, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Turning to other gods, go again to them and love them anyway. And this justifies my distaste for raisins. So how are we doing this? James tells us, verse, the second part of verse 4, this, what does this adultery look like? It looks like this. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And we read this through our modern lens and we think of friendship in a very casual Facebook friends kind of way where, oh, I added a couple yesterday. I don't know. It's not a big deal. And this isn't what James is saying at all. He's saying, no, this type of friendship in the ancient world was the sharing of all things spiritual and all things physical. The religious leaders of the day were shocked and appalled that Jesus would eat with sinners. This was a symbol of friendship, and it was more serious than maybe we view it. It would be like you considering yourself at home amongst your friends. Paul has this in mind in Corinthians when he says, be in the world, but not of the world. Of course, we need to have friendships with the world, with those who don't believe and aren't of the household of faith. Of course we do. We have to live before them in a way to, for them to see our good deeds and glorify our Father. Of course we do. This isn't what he's saying. He's saying, don't share all things with the world. Don't make your home with the world. The world and being friends with the world is making you something. And it's making you an enemy of God. Why? Because God is worthy of all of us. And this adultery that James is talking about is because God will have no rival. He will have no equal. In fact, he dwelt among us and promised to make his home with us, to share all things with us, and to make peace with God, which is what we need. And we're getting there. A little bit more goodish, baddish news. Verse 5, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns? jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. God is a jealous husband. He's a jealous husband who has put his spirit in us. And we will not be at peace until we repent and turn from other lovers. Have you thought about that this week? That God yearns jealously for you. Not in a petty, trite way that we associate with jealousy. But God is worthy of our affection and our love. He jealously yearns. And then some of the sweetest verses in all of Scripture. So in light, we are full of wrong desires. We covet, we murder, we quarrel, we strive we seek anything and everything else but God. We don't pray as we should. And then verse 6, what we need more than anything. But he gives more grace. One of the most amazing, sweet scriptures we have. My sin is deep. His grace runs deeper. You know what you need in your conflicts? Grace. Grace. There's nothing you need more because there's enough grace for your needs, for your heartbreak, for your wounds, for your hurt. Though you failed and though you've fallen, there's enough grace. And if that's true for you, it's also true for the person you have beef with, at our, you're at odds with, the person you're in conflict with. Even in the Lord's Prayer, he tells us, forgive us of our sins as in the same way that we forgive those who sin against us. We need this grace to heal us and our conflicts. How does James know this? Because he's the recipient of that grace. Because his brother Jesus died for sinners while the sinners were sinning. He died for them. Romans 8.32 says this, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He paid the whole tab. He's going to buy the soda too. There's enough grace. God did not spare his most priceless possession. He didn't spare his own son. God's work proves that he will not leave, leave us where we are but he will give us more grace. And then the second part of verse 6 says that there is a condition. 
It says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So be humble. Sit down. God's opposition of the proud is military language. God stands against the proud. In Psalm 138, verse 6, it says, For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. Or Peter says this, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Clothe yourself. Take up this type of garment. This is what you need in conflict. Humility. You need humility. We understand this. In specific types of events, I see the Trevettes back there, they're running a lot. If they went out there in a suit, their times would suffer. If they went out there in a parka, they would probably pass out because it's so hot. If we went to Antarctica, we wouldn't dress for the beach. And in conflict, we need to put on and clothe ourselves in this type of humility. Jesus even shows us this. It's the same language when he takes up the towel and he washes their feet. The creator of the universe humbles himself to this point and then humbles himself to the point of death. So how do we recognize the humble? There's, here's just a few ideas. A humble person tends to be quieter, not louder, more grateful, not more critical, more gracious, and not more condescending. They're seeking the Spirit eagerly. They're not more self-reliant. They're meeker before the Word, not more intellectually arrogant. They're more faithful in prayer and less confident in themselves. And a defining attribute of the humble is where James goes, the humble person repents. The humble person repents. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God, to God's word, to God's authority. The humble person reads this and sees themselves. The temptation in these rooms is that we start wandering to all the people who need to hear this word. Like, oh yeah, that person sitting over there, they need to hear this. And James is saying, no, submit yourself to God, moment by moment, especially in conflict. Ask yourself, am I submitting to the Lord and fleeing the devil? Because the devil is making all sorts of promises, but the problem is he can't deliver. The devil is promising flourishing, but what he delivers is destruction, oppression, and slavery bondage. Peter says this so strongly. We just read this in the CBR. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. There's a ridiculous game we used to play in middle school where we would uh, spot a friend who was in a conversation, usually a deep conversation, uh, as deep as you can in middle school. And as they were distracted, another one of our friends, we were kind kids, would sneak up behind him and right below the knee, if you, get the, if you get the right pressure, the entire leg will buckle and you will fall to the ground. Why? Because you weren't anticipating the attack. And that's what James is saying. He's saying, you have an enemy, an adversary. Wake up. You need to be aware. As Peter says, sober-minded. We try to avoid even thinking about the devil, either pretending he doesn't exist or domesticating him, taking his claws out, turning him into a little bit more than a fluffy little house cat. But he's described over and over as a lion. But he's also described as an angel of light. These things are deceptive. We need to be alert and aware. Consider what Sam Albury says about the devil. Sticking your head in the sand in the presence of a lion may dull the sound of his roaring, but it does a little to lessen your chances of being devoured. We pretend he's not there. Stick our head in the sand, and he's eating our lunch. What does resisting the devil look like? James goes on to tell us. Verse 8, draw near to God. 
and he will draw near to you. As we draw near to God, we keep in right priority, in right order, the way things ought to be. God knows what's best for me. The devil does not. He is a liar and a liar from the beginning. Return to God. No matter how far you've gone, return. But my cravings are too deep. My desires are too flawed. No, friend, they're not. There's enough grace to cover them. Verse 9, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Repent, turn, the humble repent. When they read the scriptures, they say, that's me. I need to repent. I need to turn. I need grace. And James' intensity here should shake us. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. When's the last time somebody said that to somebody at a city group? That'd be an awkward city group. He's writing to his brothers and sisters and pleading with them, wake up. I imagine him even shaking us here this morning. He's begging us to see our sin because if we don't, we won't draw near to the Lord. We won't flee the devil. We won't seek grace. We won't cherish grace. What does repentance look like? Psalm 51 is a great example. David repenting after serious sin. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is from the heart. James keeps on going. Be wretched, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Be wretched, mourn, weep. Do we view our sin as our most serious problem? God takes it sin extremely seriously. Numerous times all throughout the scriptures, we hear God's people are called to return with this type of weeping and mourning and fasting. There's a seriousness to it. If we don't taste the bitter, we don't know the sweet. If we don't see our sin, we don't really understand grace and why it's so beautiful. See, the world encourages, endorses, and celebrates sin. If sin isn't grieving us, maybe we've lost sight of the holiness of God. And this is what James is getting at. He wants us to have a living faith. He hears us coding, he grabs the paddles and approaches the heart to jolt us back to life. He's saying, wake up. God wants you to thrive, wants you to flourish. He knows you were created by him and for him so much that he sent Christ to lay it all down for you so that you can have joy and have peace. See, our deepest desires can never be fulfilled in our relationships with people. They can only be fulfilled in a relationship with a person. And that person is our creator. He is our Lord and he is our savior, Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, God made us. He invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on gasoline and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it's just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There's no such thing. So James, in summary, is telling us a really familiar commandment. He's saying, love God with all your being and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus would say that in that you have fulfilled the law. That is where true joy can be found. And we'll end in verse 10 with James. This is what James says. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. The way up is down. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the person who humbles himself will be exalted. See, our desires and cravings, they tempt us to elevate ourselves, to seek 
from others what God alone can satisfy. Our attempts of exaltation over our kids and our jobs, our friends, spouses, at school, at home, will ultimately lead to ruin and humiliation. But consider the example of Jesus who came to serve and not to be served. He came to do the Father's will, and then he died for the unfaithful, for the spiritual adulterers, the self-indulgent, for the envious, for the slanderers. He prayed for the Father's will to be done. He submitted to the Father's plan. He resisted the devil, and then he carried the cross to die in our place. And he has made peace with God. He's provided a way for us to be reconciled to God. And that would be enough, but he doesn't stop there. That would be enough. He promises to exalt the humble. See, there will come a day when there are no more conflicts, no more tears, none of the hurts that we experience in this life because of conflicts and how detrimental they can be to our lives and the lives of those around us. But when we're gathered around the throne, worshiping our creator, running on the fuel we were born to run on, we will be fully satisfied. And all of our desires will finally find their end. So brothers and sisters, humble yourselves and receive more grace. Let's pray. Father, you're so patient and so loving. This morning, again, you invite us together to be reminded of who you are and what that means for us. And then informs how we walk, knowing that the days are evil, making the most of our time, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Help us do this. We cannot do this without you. We need your grace, and then we need more grace. Be with us now, we pray. Amen.